Rob Saint. Uh, I became the Dean of Science at the University of Melbourne just over a month ago. Uh, and it's my very great pleasure to uh, offer you a very warm welcome to, these, uh, to the July Lectures in Physics on this very chilly Melbourne evening. The um, School of Physics here is one of the jewels in the Faculty of Science. I've, I've, I learned that before I even came here. Uh, so it's a particular pleasure for me to be uh, able to introduce this lecture series. The School of Physics has a about 100 staff, about 70, 70 honorary staff and 90 research students. And it has about 1,800 uh, undergraduate students go through its doors uh, during semester. These, um, uh, the the uh, faculty itself has strengths in experimental particle physics, material science, theoretical physics, optics and x-rays, and astrophysics, and it's the uh, topic of astrophysics that's this year's theme. These July lectures have been going since 1968, and I'm told that uh, there are some uh, people who've been attending uh, throughout that time, so I actually just wondered if anyone here went to that 1968 lecture. Um, this year there are going to be... Oh, there is one? Where are we? Ah, oh, there we are. Wonderful. Yes, because this is my first, not having uh, been at this university. And this year there are five lectures, as you can see. The, uh, um, the original advertised program only had four. We fitted an additional uh, lecture in from, uh, um, from Jeremy Mould, who recently won the Gruber Prize. <laughs> yes, congratulations, Jeremy. He's sitting down, down the front if anyone wants to know. Um, now the reason the, uh, uh, the theme this year is uh, astrophysics, or as astronomy I should say, is that this is the uh, International Year of Ast Astronomy. It was declared that by the General Assembly of the, of the United Nations. Uh, the reason for that is that it's the 400th year since Galileo turned a telescope to the sky and started looking at what was really out there, out there beyond what we could see with the naked eye. And this year, as you see, speakers from all over Australia are going to be coming here to, to present um, lectures. Now, uh, physics is obviously a fundamental uh, science. Uh, however, it has its basis in mathematics. And I couldn't help but noticing that the square root of 400 is 20. And that's actually uh, the number of times that David has presented, I believe, well, this is, this is the, <laughs> the 20. Um, means he gave his first lecture in 1990. Now, were any of you at that lecture? Do any of you remember a, a young David? He had lots of hands ago. That's right. He hasn't changed a bit, has he? That's, the, that's what he tells me. Um, so David got his PhD here at the, in physics at the University of Melbourne. He uh, did postdoctoral research at Caltech and at the University of Oxford, and then came back uh, to the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's a member of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Quantum Computer Technology. Uh, that's the VARC, the Australian Research Council, of course. Uh, and they study ways of storing and processing information using the, the strange laws of, of uh, quantum mechanics. And he talked about his work uh, at last year's lectures. He's uh, been a finalist in the uh, Australian Awards for University Teaching. He's published over 200 research papers. And he's, he was the president of the Australian Institute of Physics uh, from, uh, in 2005 and 2006. So he's one of the, uh, he's one of the stars of, a, of our faculty. Now I think uh, in, in introducing him, I'd just like to say that there are obviously many ways that you, you can look at science, what it means and what it does. And uh, I'd just like to highlight three. The, the obvious one is that science, uh, in my opinion, is by far the best way of moving to a better understanding of our world. That's, that's really why many of us get involved in science. We want to understand the world that, that, that we uh, inhabit. The second one is, of course, that science does much more than that. We use science to solve problems. We use science to develop approaches to uh, issues. We, we, we use science to improve our life. But the third, and I think the one we talk about least, uh, is that science is transformative. It's culturally transformative. 
And uh, we've seen that over the last decade with the development of the internet, for example. The, the, the life of, of my children is totally different from my life in the way that they interact socially, the way that they are thinking culturally, culturally the way that they get their, their news uh, in, in all kinds of respects. What we're um, celebrating in a way with this uh, 400th anniversary of Galileo's activity is, I think, still arguably the most transformative of all the um, uh, actions of science, at least in the, in the Western world. And that's the work of uh, uh, people like Galileo who, who uh, started to take us away from the uh, geocentric view of our universe. So it's my um, very great pleasure to ask David to, uh, to talk to us about that topic. Thank you. Well, Rob, thank you very much for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, tonight's uh, topic uh, is uh, the uh, details of what we're celebrating in this uh, 400th anniversary of uh, Galileo's invention of the telescope and pointing it to the sky. And uh, in presenting this lecture to you, I want to cover uh, several major themes. I want to cover, perhaps, uh, most importantly, the technology of the telescope, what it was that Gal Galileo did, the physics behind what he put together. I also want to cover a little bit, uh, of course, on what he discovered. And uh, as you see here, a new planet. Galileo is not actually famous for discovering new planets. But I want to uh, reveal to you that uh, there may be evidence hidden still within the notebooks of Galileo that he did discover a new planet. And also I want to cover, uh, as uh, Rob already indicated in the introduction, a little bit of the, uh, the culture, the cultural change that Galileo introduced uh, when he made these discoveries. It uh, really did change the world. So, whoops. So, to, uh, to kick this off, I just want to show my connections uh, with Galileo. Uh, not uh, Galileo the man, of course, but uh, Galileo the uh, space probe. When I was a, a postdoc in California, I went to the uh, open day of the Jet Propulsion Labs, and uh, this was shortly after the um, uh, the uh, Challenger disaster, and they brought uh, the Galileo uh, space probe back to the clean rooms at, uh, in uh, Pasadena to uh, rejig it to get it ready to launch again. I've used a very soft focus so you can see that I'm exactly the same in this picture. <laughs> Taken in 1987 as I am today, as Rob indicated. Um, this, uh, this probe was very aptly named because it spent uh, much of its life in uh, orbit uh, around uh, Jupiter, and indeed now. <clears throat> the atoms of this probe are now somewhere adrift in the atmosphere of Jupiter after it was deliberately uh, crashed into the atmosphere after a very long, a very long career in orbit around uh, Jupiter, a 14-year mission altogether. So this got me uh, very interested in uh, Galileo and why this probe was named after him. So before I talk about then what Galileo did, I should talk a little bit about what the world was like before Galileo. And so, uh, 1539, this was a, a diagram of the known universe. So, clearly we've got uh, the Earth at the centre, because common sense tells you that the Earth uh, doesn't move, and humans are notoriously self-centred anyway. And orbiting the Earth, there were the planets of the solar system. Now, it's a little bit difficult um, uh, to, to actually plot this out, because the observational evidence, even to the unaided eye, uh, is a little bit confusing as to uh, where Mercury and Venus orbit. So in this diagram, uh, there's the Moon first, then Mercury, then Venus, but sometimes Mercury and Venus are switched around the other way because it really doesn't make sense. And of course, the big one is the Sun uh, orbiting around the Earth once a day. So this was the universe, <coughs> and, and way out here are the fixed stars on the uh, celestial sphere. This was the world that was handed down since time immemorial this was the world that seemed to be consistent with common sense. Well, as we've learned uh, in uh, 20 years of July lectures, well, as I've learned in giving 20 years of July lectures, common sense is not a very reliable guide to the way the world works because the universe feels pretty much no obligation at all to work the way our common sense says it should. And even the solar system defies common sense. So let me just start with the man and his astronomy. I'll just get that out of the way so there's only one head in your field of view. Um, right, 
that's good. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit of the history of Galileo and uh, what it was that uh, he discovered uh, 400 years ago. Um, so here's a quick uh, part of history. Born in uh, 1564 in Pisa and went on to become the professor of mathematics uh, at the University of Pisa. I haven't actually advertised that too widely in case our mathematical colleagues claim uh, Galileo as a mathematician instead of a physicist. Uh, but he soon uh, saw the light and moved to Padua um, in the Venice Republic, as it was there, still as a professor of uh, mathematics and the natural sciences. And in May of 1608, he had what must have been a transformative experience where he heard rumours of a spyglass that had been invented in the Dutch uh, Republic. Uh, the inventor tried to patent it, but the patent attorneys or the, the patent office rejected it because they said it was too obvious. It wasn't worth patenting. Uh, but he heard about this, but he didn't know the uh, technical details. So he um, uh, must have realised the uh, immense potential of such a device. So he rushed basically back to the lab as a mathematician. You mightn't always have a lab, but he did. And he made his own lenses and he had access to the, the, the great uh, glass factories of Venice, uh, so he had access to very good glass. And in November 1609, his telescope was ready and he pointed it to the sky. There's some indication in the, in the literature that other people had uh, built spy glasses not as good as Galileo's and pointed them to the sky, but the things they did wrong was that they didn't publish their discoveries. And as we know in science, you publish or you perish, and those people have all long since perished. But it has to be said, all credit to Galileo, his technical uh, skills were of a very high order, and I believe for more than 20 years after 1609, if you wanted a telescope good enough to see the stars, the planets, and what have you, you had to order it from Galileo. Uh, so, in uh, December 1609, he, well, he didn't discover the moon of Earth, that was pretty obvious, but he discovered, by putting his telescope at the moon, he saw all sorts of features, mountains, valleys, craters, things that are not uh, possible to see with the unaided eye. And this was very puzzling, because dogma had it that the moon and the other celestial objects were featureless, smooth uh, uh, spheres and shouldn't have uh, mountains and so forth that you might find down on the Earth. But then in January of 1610, he turned his uh, telescope to Jupiter and immediately discovered the uh, moons of Jupiter, four of them that are visible through his telescope, and this was truly sensational, as I'll describe shortly. So he immediately wrote up all his discoveries for publication, and this uh, appeared in March of 1610, only a few months after he made these discoveries. And I believe, uh, from reading the literature, he was writing the last observations on a parchment which was whisked away by the publisher who ran the presses and got it out just a week later. So it's almost as good as posting it on the archive, hey, Adrian, right? even though it was 400 years ago. Um, and this was uh, Siderius Nuncius, a sensational uh, little book, uh, more on that later. It's going to be the focus uh, of the lecture tonight. But then in January of 1613, continuing his astronomical observations, he made a sensational discovery. More on that later. <laughs> then, from 1614 onwards, as his fame began to grow and his advocacy of the heliocentric model of the solar system, uh, became widespread, he started getting into trouble uh, for advocating that the Earth orbited the Sun. And in fact, by 1633, he was called to the Inquisition and ordered to abjure, that retract uh, this uh, model and not promote it, uh, and subject to house arrest uh, for the remaining 10 years of his life. And in fact, some of his books weren't removed from the list of banned books until 1835. It's one of my personal aspirations to get a book onto the list of them. <laughs> so this is where most of the action uh, in his later life took place in Florence, the River Arno. This is the old city. Uh, Galileo actually owned a house down here, and when he was confined to house arrest, he had to move to the countryside out here, which is great because the, the skies are darker and better for astronomical observations. <laughs> now, it turns out that Galileo was actually a very devout Catholic. Now, I haven't got time to go into all the details of the uh, religious implications of what he discovered, but his motivations were sincere. He wanted to protect the church from putting forward ideas that could be 
refuted by scientific observations. So he was a devout Catholic. He also fathered three illegitimate children by his housekeeper. He, how he kept all those, and he displaced the earth from the centre of the universe. How he kept all those things in his mind at the one time is, is must be, must have been an enormous challenge. Uh, he's also, of course, the father of modern science, the father of physics, the father of uh, astronomy, uh, as well as those three children. <laughs> so this is uh, now the bigger picture of where the action uh, took place. Uh, Galileo started in Pisa, moved to Padua, and then ended up in Florence. And it's also worth noting that his contemporary and colleague, Johannes Kepler, uh, who was, if you like, the astrophysicist theorist, uh, working in Tübingen and uh, Prague at, at the same time. And uh, Galileo and Kepler exchanged voluminous correspondence. And Kepler was always very eager to hear of Galileo's latest discoveries. And Galileo would tease Kepler something awful, as you'll see with some examples coming up. Now, uh, I went over to Florence uh, uh, over Christmas to check out the place for myself, and uh, this is uh, me standing outside uh, Galileo's house. It wasn't um, a house where he lived very much. Uh, this is the one down near the banks of the river, uh, but it's where his son lived for most of uh, his uh, career. Uh, very nice place. There's a little round of Galileo above the front door, and just up the hill there's Viale Galileo, and just down the hill, as this is the evidence of, is probably the place where Galileo went to spend a penny. Well, I certainly did, and it cost me 60 euro cents. But anyway, evidence I was definitely there. Uh, now, just back on the other side of the river, there is the National Library, Library of Florence, and um, in December uh, last year they uh, had this exhibition. Uh, which was only for people with a library card, but I tested experimentally the theory that if you went in, this was um, uh, Galileo, the universe in his library, I, t I wanted to see this exhibition, and I tested the theory that if I went into the front desk and waved my ha hands and shouted Galileo often enough, they let me in, and they did. <laughs> and so here is the uh, exhibition, and this was remarkable because these are the books that Galileo had on his desk. These are the physics textbooks such as they were in 1609, where he learned his science, where he learned his stuff. And these books are heavily annotated in his own hand. And it was just fantastic to see these books. These were the formative influence of Galileo's science and his career. Uh, then just out the back of the library is uh, the church of Santa Croce. And of course, inside that church, moved there after Galileo's name began to be rehabilitated some hundred years after he died, is his tomb. And those of you who have read uh, Darva Sobel's book will know that there are one, two, and indeed a third woman in this picture. But let's go back now to his work, enough of his environment. This is the key book uh, that he published in 1610, The Starry Messenger. Um, Word that Galileo had made an important discovery or a series of important discoveries must have spread like wildfire across Europe because well, this was published in March of 1610, it sold out within the day. And this picture is the cover of a pirated copy that was made in Frankfurt from an original just a few months after the original had hit the, hit the presses. So it's extraordinary that this was pirated just a few months and um, and, and, and because the demand was so great to learn about what he discovered. Um, if you um, have a look, uh, there's uh, some copies of this uh, which uh, represent the uh, publisher's proofs. And in this particular page, in the publisher's proof, there are these hand-drawn diagrams of, of the moon and the, and the craters and the mountains drawn by Galileo's own hand uh, in, in the uh, proof edition probably drawn just a few days or weeks after he saw these features for the very first time. But let's open the book and uh, see what's there. The reason why this book uh, became um, so sensational is because, of course, Copernicus, some 100 years earlier, had already started to challenge the conventional wisdom, and other people were starting to realise that even the unaided eye observations of the way this, uh, the planets moved and so forth were inconsistent with the geocentric model. And so uh, no less a person than the English ambassador 
in the uh, Republic of Venice. So Henry Wotton was observing Galileo uh, from, from Venice. Padua is just up the, up the line from Venice, not far away. And the day Galileo's book hit the, hit the presses, he obtained a copy and forwarded it to uh, the King of England, King, King James I at the time, with a letter that said, the author, who was Galileo, runneth a fortune to be either exceeding famous or exceeding ridiculous. So sensational were the things in this little book. So let's open the book and see what's there. So in the title page, Siderius Nuncius, the sidereal messenger, or the starry messenger, the signals that Galileo was recording uh, with his uh, eye applied to the eyepiece of his telescope. And he's put in the front here, unfolding great and very wonderful sights and displaying to the gaze of everyone, but especially to philosophers and astronomers, the things, were observed, the things that were observed by Galileo Galilei. He called his a instrument a perspicile, uh, which is translated to mean spyglass. Telescope didn't come in to, for, for some years later. And in particular, the highlight, four planets, by which he means moons, flying around the star, by which he means planet, of Jupiter at unequal intervals and periods with wonderful swiftness, which unknown to anyone until the day, to this day, the first author detected recently and decided to the name the Medician Stars. He named it after the uh, famous Medici family because he was seeking funding from them. <laughs> and, over 400 years, little has changed. <laughs> now, I piped the English translation of the text of this remarkable book into the, um, the word sorter here, and uh, the size of these words gives you an idea of the words that appear most frequently in the book. So, obviously, moon and moons is what it's, it's all about, the moons of Jupiter, Jupiter's prominence highly, uh, strongly, Earth, here, light, observed, stars, the sun, the telescope, well, that's the English translation. These are the big themes. These are the big things that uh, are in this book. So let's turn a few pages. Here are his observations of the moon. These remarkable observations that where the terminator, the shadow uh, from the sun, falls across the moon, you can see shadows of giant mountains, the walls of the craters, from the wiggles of the shadow. Clearly, the surface of the moon was not smooth. Uh, but there were places like the floors of the craters and the seas where the shadow was straight, which Galileo interpreted these to be plains or perhaps seas. This was a remarkable uh, result from, for something that had always been considered to be perfectly smooth. But even more remarkably, when he pointed his telescope at familiar constellations like the Pleiades, I think you can see about nine of these stars from a reasonably dark sight with the unaided eye. Maybe young people can see more. But with his telescope, he discovered 34 new stars in the constellation of the Pleiades that no one had known before him had existed. This is a, an image taken through a reproduction telescope. You can see the bright ones and the familiar pattern, and all these other dim ones become visible. But here is the sensational stuff, his observation of the moons of Jupiter. So night after night, he'd look at Jupiter and write down the positions of the Medician stars. And uh, uh, over just a week or so, he realized that these four, uh, four moons were orbiting uh, Jupiter. And of course, here's a close-up of them now, Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa, named after Galileo, the Galilean moons. Now, the reason why this was sensational was not just that these uh, moons had never been seen before, although there's some indication in the literature that maybe the, uh, the ancient Chinese uh, 2,000 years ago had seen one, uh, but hadn't seen it with the unaided eye, but hadn't seen it long enough to realise that it was in orbit around Jupiter, and therefore hadn't really discovered a moon as such. But the fact that these moons did not orbit the Earth was sensational. These were four objects that orbited Jupiter that anybody with the right telescope, with the right bit of equipment, could see for themselves. So this was the first time something had been discovered going around something other than Earth. So Earth clearly was not the centre of the universe as far as the Medician moons were concerned. So this put one of the main axioms of the geocentric model of the solar system in serious trouble. Galileo's telescope was probably good enough to see the fact that these four moons are of different sizes. In this little uh, sketch down here, they're conveniently arranged in order of smallest to largest. 
uh, judging by these symbols. So I've tentatively identified that as Europa, that as Io, uh, that as Callisto, and that as Ganymede. I haven't done the computer simulations for that night in question, but I'm sure that's correct. He continued to make observations after this book was published uh, because the sky was wide open to his view. And here's a publication from 1623 uh, where he's recorded a sketch of Saturn. He uh, writes in the text, Saturn appeared three-bodied because he couldn't resolve the rings from the, the planet itself. Uh, he also has made this sensational discovery that Venus was not just a circular disk, but showed phases like the moon. So if we zoom in for a close-up, there's uh, his sketch of Saturn, uh, as he saw it in 1610. That's what it looks like through a Galilean telescope. Uh, very hard to see at the limit of resolution, and Galileo thought it either had ears sticking out the side, or two giant moons sitting beside it. And to his consternation, in 1616, these giant moons vanished from view because at that time, the plane of the rings was in the line of sight and you could only see, well, he couldn't because his telescope wasn't good enough, but a thin stripe across the face of the planet. It took another 20 years before it was figured out the nature of the planet Saturn. But this, uh, this discovery Galileo regarded as his own and so sensational that when he first saw these two ears, or these moons, or what we now know to be the rings. He wanted to establish that he was the first to see it. And he was terrified that any person could stick two bits of glass in, the tube, in a tube and make the same uh, discovery and publish it before him. He was very modern in that respect. <laughs> so what he did, he sent a letter to Kepler, his uh, theoretical astrophysicist colleague, if, if, if I may, Jeremy, for, for Kepler, uh, and sent an anagram. He encoded his discovery in a meaningless string of characters here in the letter to Kepler. Now, this used to drive Kepler absolutely nuts because Kepler was desperate for Galileo to prove some of his theories. And when he received this string of meaningless letters, he knew it was an anagram and he worked tirelessly day and night to decode it. And eventually he decoded it to read the planet Mars has two moons. Because Kepler reasoned that if Earth had one and Galilei and uh, Jupiter had four, then Mars must have two. <laughs> like geometrical progression. But he had to delete one of the letters to make it work. So he thought Galileo might have made a mistake. And eventually Galileo put him out of his misery and sent him the decoded anagram, which is Altissimum Planetum Tergemimium Observavi. Which, which uh, translated into English means, I have observed the highest of the planets, Saturn, therefore, which was the highest planet known in those days, three-formed. And so therefore he was able to encode his discovery, establish his primacy, but not reveal it to uh, other people who were looking at the skies through telescopes. Now this is the first anagram I want to show you tonight. I want to show you two more, which we'll get to in a moment. Next, Venus here, as I indicated, it shows uh, phases just like the Moon. And I highly recommend uh, going out and looking at Venus just with a pair of binoculars in the evening or the dawn sky, because it's a remarkable and disturbing sight to see what looks like a bright star resolve itself into a thin crescent, a large thin crescent, or, depending on the time of the month or the, uh, the year on Venus, it sometimes looks like a small disk. Now, the fact that the size of these appearances are correlated with the phase, that is to say how much of the disk of the planet Venus is illuminated, could only be explained if Venus was orbiting the Sun. It could not be explained if Venus was orbiting the Earth. And so this was extremely powerful evidence for the heliocentric model of the solar system. This cannot be explained easily with the geocentric model. And again, this is uh, what uh, Venus looks like through a modern telescope, and this is what, it would look, what, what Galileo would have seen. So again, another anagram went off to Kepler. This time, uh, it looks like it means something. I forget uh, how that uh, translates into uh, English. Of course, uh, Galileo and Kepler are writing to each other in Latin, the lingua franca of science then. 
Uh, but if you rearrange the anagram, again, to put Kepler out of his misery after begging letters, Galileo told him, uh, this is what it, how it uh, is uh, decoded, and Cynthia figuras emulatur meta amorum, uh, which can be translated into English as the mother of love imitates the shape of Cynthia. Now, I'm looking for an opportunity to put a sentence like that in my next publication. <laughs> But sadly, we don't use in physics that sort of language anymore. And of course, by the mother of love, he meant Venus, and Cynthia, he meant the moon. So in other words, his, his revealing, or his, his encryption up here, reveals his discovery of the phases of Venus. That's the second anagram. One more to go later on. He also uh, turned his telescope to the sun, didn't look through it directly, because that would have been very dangerous, he knew that, but used the eyepiece projection method to see the sun, and much to his amazement, he discovered it was covered with spots. Uh, these were not, uh, they, these came and went. Uh, they, they weren't regular like they, they might have been, as some people said, they were little planets orbiting the sun, and he, uh, he, he assumed they were some kind of blemishes on the, on the disk of the sun. Again, that was very disturbing because conventional wisdom had it. The sun, the preeminent celestial body, should have been spherical and perfect and not have black spots wandering about on it. Uh, and there was another astronomer emerging uh, out of the woodwork who claimed to have seen the sunspots and published them before Galileo, and so began a lifelong feud as to who was the first to discover sunspots, but I don't have an anagram for you to prove Galileo was first in this case. So there are the discoveries, the early discoveries uh, that we're celebrating. So let me now turn to the telescope itself and talk about the technology that went into the telescope. Now, this is how Galileo put his telescope. Again, he's always after the main chance to get a funding opportunity. So he describes this to the, um, the Dukes uh, of uh, Florence, the, uh, the Medicis. Most serene prince, uh, forget all that uh, obsequious stuff, uh, I'm going to present to your highness a telescope that will be a great help in maritime and land enterprises. I assure you I shall keep this new invention a great secret and show it only to your highness. Well, that's no good. The cat was already out of the bag back in 1608 because of the refused patent in Holland. Uh, but it was made for the most accurate study of distances, has the advantage of discovering ships of the enemy hours before they could be seen with the natural vision, distinguish the number and quality of the ships, judge the strength and be ready to chase them, to fight them, or to flee from them. I don't think that was a good error, a good, good idea to <laughs> advise that the Duke might have to flee. But, you know, discretion is the better part of valour, I guess. Or in the open country, to see all details and to distinguish every movement and preparation. So, just like writing a grant application today, you must really praise up what it is you're doing. So, how does it work? Well, first of all, I want to describe how a lens works. Uh, now, this is um, uh, not so straightforward, actually, because uh, if I um, uh, stand up here in, in front of you, as indeed I am, uh, and I observe that the uh, front of this uh, bench is uh, uh, glowing with a, a, a pale white light. Where does that light come from? Well, it's come from all of you people. The lights in the roof have reflected off you. Some light has come directly and it's hit this and it's a complete shambles. There are no details there. It's a uniform grey wash. But nevertheless, there are images there if that light can be rearranged. Now, let me take just a small disk from this uh, panel here, only a few millimetres in diameter. There we are, I've taken it and I've allowed the light to enter the iris of my eye. Well, when my iris rearranges that light, I see all you guys sitting there looking at me. <laughs> so in other words, by simply rearranging what is a complete shambles here with an iris and a lens, I can make an image. And I can also do that by simply using a pinhole, although the image is very dim, by just allowing one light ray from every point in the room to pass through the pinhole onto the screen, I can make an inverted image. And the lens simply contributes to that inverted image by rearranging the other rays which would have otherwise caused chaos, like up in here, and bending them down to reach the point where the pinhole image is located. So the lens serves like a super pinhole, but it can bend light and bring it to a focus. Now, the second thing you've got to keep in mind, the light coming from a distant object expands uniformly in space in spherical uh, wavefronts. 
until it reaches a distant object. And you can draw in these rays to follow along uh, the, uh, the radius of the uh, spherical wave fronts heading out into space. And you can see as you get a long way away, these two arrows become almost parallel. And you can see that this is starting to get very flat out here as the diameter gets very large. And so if we now step back a very large distance, the light coming from a distant object is essentially a flat wave front, which means that all the light rays coming from a different object are essentially heading in the same direction. They're parallel. So from this yellow star, the light is entering the iris of the eye parallel. And if there was another star up here, the light is entering the eye also parallel, but with a slightly different angle. And so what you want to do with your telescope, with your lens, is make these things further apart, or make them appear further apart, because most of the things in the sky are very close together, and you don't get a very good view of them. So let me uh, also uh, illustrate that with this uh, simple demo. Uh, Steve, can you switch to the auxiliary input, please? To show uh, the way you want to set this up, I've got a very simple demonstration here. I've got uh, three lenses that uh, bend the light by different amounts, and they're all looking at this little light bulb over here. So there are three simultaneous Im images from the three lenses I've got down the front here. First of all, I'll start with this lens over here. So I'll just cover that up so you can see which one I'm looking at. This is a lens with a focal length about the same as, the, uh, as, as your eye. So if you put your eye down here, that's how big the image would be that you would see. Now, if we switch to this lens here, and I'll cover that up so you can see which one that is. This is a lens which has a focal length of 58 millimetres, and more importantly, it has an F number of F1.4. Now, I only mention that because for the older people in the audience, you'll know that an F1.4 lens is something you just don't find in the shops anymore. So this is a large slab of glass that collects a lot of light and focuses it to that image. You can see how bright this is, how big it is, how bright it is. This is a very nice lens. You can't buy them anymore. I had to get that one off eBay last week. <coughs> But down here is the image from the third lens, which is this lens here. This is a lens with a focal length of about one metre. This is the lens that Galileo used, not this particular lens, but a similar one, in his telescope. And you can see the way it works. It takes the light from the, the light bulb and focuses it to an image that's way over here. This is the camera that's making that image. You see, if I put my hand in front of it. And look how big that image is. It's huge. So if you were to put your eye down and look at that image, you can cast it onto a piece of uh, an opaque screen and look at it, you can see this light bulb in all its detail. It's been enormously magnified. So we went from a focal length of about 16 millimetres to a focal length of 58 millimetres and finally to a focal length all the way over here of a metre and we got a huge image. Now, the image um, is also brighter than what you would see with the unaided eye. And the bigger the lens is, the better it is at collecting the light and focusing the image so that you can see things that are too dim to be seen with the unaided eye. So that was the first thing that Galileo did. Now, the second thing he did was, uh, there's no point, well, he didn't have CCD cameras in those days, and there's no point in putting a screen there and casting the image onto it if you're looking at the sky. I'd invite you to come down. If you put your hand there, you can see a focused image of the filament uh, dimly on your hand. You needed some way of looking at this image directly. And so what Galileo realised that he could put a, another lens here, which was diverging, and it would return the light converging at this point into parallel rays, which is what the eye likes to see, because the eye likes looking at things that are far away, where the light is coming in parallel, because it relaxes. You don't have to squint so hard to focus. So, Steve, can you fire up the uh, smoke box for me over here? And so what I uh, try to do now is show you, in this demonstration, the effect of the uh, second lens. Can I just go back to the... Um, let's get this one back up here. That's the one? Yep, that's it. Put on you. 
So you can see the light coming from the front lens converging down into this eyepiece where it is pulled out and made parallel. And if we've got some smoke flowing uh, now, see? Uh, and I've set this up in this box. Uh, still going? I'll flip that on and see if we can see it anyway. Okay, we'll get that box filled with smoke and simultaneously not set off the fire alarm for you in just a moment. So in Galileo's telescope, he chose an objective with a focal length of 980 millimetres. He grounded himself in order to get maximum magnification with the, uh, with, with the skills he had. And he had an eyepiece with a, a diverging lens with a focal length of negative 50 millimetres. Now, these lenses were already in wide circulation. Because of this phenomenon of presbyopia, uh, now presbyopia, uh, sorry, what does that mean again? Presbyopia, pres damn, uh, it's uh, presbyopia. Oh, it's derived from the word for old person. <laughs> damn, cheap. But, uh, I had to buy these in Florence so I could read the fine print in the museum uh, catalogue, sadly enough. But they are lenses with a long focal length. Some people suffer from myopia, which is the opposite problem, uh, in which case they have to have a diverging lens, and so both of these type of lenses were widely uh, made by opticians. And so I'm sorry to say my colleague in the Department of Optometry and Vision Sciences tried to claim Galileo as the first optician. <laughs> But the optician's lenses weren't good enough to make a telescope and uh, only good for toys. Um, in, a, in, this, in this example, uh, to scale, this is a telescope with a magnification of two. Uh, you can see these two stars, a green one and a, a yellow one here. The light passes through. Uh, the diverging lens intercepts the light before it comes to a focus, represented by these dotted lines, where it's pulled out parallel again. And so now this green star, instead of appearing here, where it is in actuality, appears up here where this uh, red uh, uh, outline is shown. And so this yellow arrow represents the magnification by how much you've pulled those stars apart, you can see more detail. And so in Gal and, and the magnification, the amount by which this green star is separated from the yellow star on the axis, is just given by the ratio of the focal lengths of the two lenses and for Galileo's telescope, the magnification is about 20. He his best one, his, his absolute best telescope is about 20. He worked hard to make the magnification larger, but the technology for grinding the lens just wasn't with him. Uh, and it, they didn't give better images. Nevertheless, he was able to see things, stars down to ninth magnitude, which is about three orders of magnitude dimmer than what's possible with the uh, unaided eye. And this was plenty to see the moons of Jupiter. Now, there is another technological innovation in his telescope. He made the tube out of these wooden slats. These are a group of people who uh, made uh, high-precision replicas of Galileo's telescopes for museums. And this is an ingenious technique, probably almost as ingenious as the idea of the telescope itself, where you cut the, uh, cut the wood up into these thin slats, you glue them together, and it makes this tube which is incredibly rigid and incredibly strong. You put leather around it, you emboss it with gold, and you give it to the Duke, and your funding is assured. <laughs> and the telescope is on display uh, uh, in the uh, Galileo Telescope Exhibition in Florence in the Museum of Science, and I went down to have a look at it. Unfortunately, they don't let you photograph it, but on the ticket, uh, you can see the display of the lens, the objective lens, the equivalent of this one here, now broken, uh, that was on display. I was really amazed in looking at this um, piece of glass because it's a very nondescript piece of glass. It was such a slight thing to have caused so many revolutionary changes. So uh, not being able to borrow Galileo's telescope uh, for my own use, I had to make my own. So here are two lenses I ordered off the internet and my colleague Roland Szymanski very kindly made this very nice tube and assembled uh, these lenses into a telescope. And we, we, oh, look at that. That's fantastic, Steve. Thank you very much. So you can see now, um, these, uh, these are, this is not configured like a telescope, but you can see the light rays passing into the objective, converging on the eyepiece, and then coming out parallel, but closer together, therefore brighter. 
So, um, if you, uh, I would invite you at the end of the lecture to come down and have a look through this telescope yourself, but I can actually, um, uh, thanks to some modern technology, I can actually show you uh, what, uh, what you would see if you look through here. Okay, uh, so what I've, uh, what I've done, okay, I can tell you what I've done. Uh, I couldn't bring Jupiter into the lecture theatre because that would have been very inconvenient. So on the back wall, um, I have uh, an image of Jupiter to scale of what it would be, how big Jupiter would be if it was stuck on the back wall of the lecture theatre instead of out in space. But I would invite you to come down afterwards and uh, have a look through the eyepiece yourself. And it's very instructive to compare what you would see through Galileo's telescope with what you see through this modern one. Oh, that's really, really nice. But here we go. There's the image from the back wall, roughly 25 uh, metres away. Indeed, you can see Jupiter and the four moons. So uh, that's exactly what Galileo would have seen. So what was the accomplishment? From the naked eye, you get two of those for free, a resolution of 18 seconds of an arc, when I say resolution, this is uh, this, the, the, the things that are the, uh, the, the uh, separation you have to have between two, two things to see them apart. 18 seconds of arc is equivalent to 18 20 cent pieces held up by somebody six kilometres away. You could just barely see that they're holding something up. Galileo's telescope enabled you to see 3.8 seconds of an arc, uh, which is equivalent to only. Um, uh, four 20 cent pieces held together by someone standing six kilometres away. You can see that just barely through his telescope. But if you really want to see things up close, you should use the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a focal length of 54,000 millimetres, and that has a resolution of 0.059 seconds of an arc. So that's a tiny fraction of a 20 cent piece held up 20, uh, 16, uh, six kilometres away. And it has a number of other advantages as well. But uh, I think, uh, if I may quote uh, Professor Jeremy Mould here, that the step from the naked eye to Galileo uh, was as big a step as Galileo to Hubble, which shows how dramatic this uh, innovation was. So let me now turn to the third part of my talk here tonight and talk about an even more sensational discovery than everything that's gone before, in my view. It's very fortunate that you can get copies of Galileo's note notebooks off the web, so you can do your own research into things that he saw. Uh, and I was alerted to this page uh, by this very nice article in Nature from 1980. So these are observations made of Jupiter in, on the nights of 1612 and 1613, uh, from December through to January. And you can see Galileo has been meticulous. He's drawn uh, if I, if I zero, zero in for a close-up here, he's drawn a sketch of the disk of Jupiter. He's drawn beside it where he saw the moons on that particular night, the four that were visible through his telescope. And he's carefully recorded the position of the moons in units of the diameter of the disk of Jupiter. So you can still use these observations today. Now, Jupiter is a planet. Planet means wanderer. So while he was training his telescope on Jupiter, Jupiter's moving across the sky, and every now and then a star would drift past the field of view as he's tracking Jupiter. And he would faithfully record those stars, and here I've identified this one that he saw in December of 1612, and in the close-up, well, there was Jupiter, there are the units, and there is what he's labelled as a star fixer. He's written here, fixer, fixed star not a planet. So it's instructive now to bring up the computer simulations for this night in 1612 and see what star that was. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is no such star in any star catalogue. This is how he was able to make his accurate quantitative observations, or so we think, he never recorded the details but by using one eye to look through the telescope and the other eye to focus on a grid, which he could slide backwards and forwards along the tube, he could make the opening in the grid the same as the diameter of Jupiter, and then just read off the positions of the moon. So this was a very, we, uh, his observations have stood the test of time. Here's another observation from his notebook. January the 6th, 1613, 
Again, he's plotted Jupiter and the four uh, Galilean moons. But over here, there's something that isn't labelled. Is this a random ink smudge? Indeed, the publishers, the librarian in Florence who puts these images on the web, thought so, and they airbrushed it out. <laughs> the only way you can see this mysterious black dot is to go and look at the original manuscript. So is this a random ink smudge, or is it something new? Now let's fast forward to January the 28th of 1613. Again, we see Jupiter, and here we see uh, uh, three of the moons. And over here, 29 diameters of Jupiter away in this direction, there's something he's labelled A. And when you look this up in a star chart for that night, you find this is in the Smithsonian Astronomical Observatory, number 119234. In other words, a fair dinkum star. But over here, there's a little inset. And again, he's labelled A, and another thing, he's labelled B. And just uh, to put this back together again for the first time in uh, nearly 400 years, mm -hmm. I'll just shift that across there so you can see what I'm talking about. So this B was off the edge of his manuscript, or near the edge of his manuscript, and that's why he's drawn it as, a, as an insert over here. This B, again, does not appear in any star chart. B. Remarkably, Galileo writes down here, this object, B, appeared to be more distant from the other, A, on this night, January 28, to what it was the night before. Galileo had seen the gap between B and A widen. Let's check out what the computer simulation has to say for this momentous night. Well, first of all, uh, we'll quickly go back to December 28, 1612. Uh, this is from Stellarium, an excellent uh, product you can download. Here's uh, Jupiter, here are the, uh, the moons. Let's drop in Galileo's notebook here and see how good he was. So we can line up Jupiter beautifully, Ganymede, Io, Europa and Callisto spot on. And here, fixer, the dotted line, out to this object over here that he's recorded with a dotted line, not a solid line, with no units to the edge of his page. Now this is remarkable because this red circle represents the field of view of his telescope. The field of view of his telescope, as you'll see if you look through here, is extremely narrow. You can't even see the whole full moon. So in other words, in order to record this object, he would have had to pan his telescope away from Jupiter into the inky blackness of space in order to see this and plot its position relative to Jupiter. And as I've indicated already, this is not a star. And the reason why it's not a star is because it's a planet. This is indeed the planet Neptune visible and recorded in Galileo's notebook on the night of December 28, 1612, and assumed to be a fixed star. It's of eighth magnitude, that means it's too dim for the eye to see. It was only possible to see this through Galileo's telescope. The planet Neptune, 234 years before its official discovery. Now let's fast forward to January 6, 1613. Here's the simulation, there's his notebook. And if we again line it up, we can see he's done a fantastic job. And that mysterious dot, which was airbrushed out of the version online, <laughs> is almost in exactly the right place to be the planet Neptune. Not quite. Almost. I find that significant. I'll explain why in a moment. Now let's run forward to January 28, 1613. Again, look at this spot-on agreement. Io uh, was transiting uh, Jupiter on this night, so it wasn't visible because it was uh, in front of uh, the disk of Jupiter. And again, look, there's the dotted line he drew, 29 diameters of Jupiter. There's the star, SAO 119234, and there, right next to it, outside of the field of view of his telescope, looking at Jupiter, he would have had to move it across is the planet Neptune. 
So for some reason, this object was of special interest to him. He was prepared to pan away from Jupiter and risk getting lost in the blackness of space, because you can't see this with the unaided eye, to follow this object. So, the computer simulations clearly identify that he had seen Neptune and recorded it accurately. And this was discovered in uh, 1980, uh, this uh, fixer being, Jupiter, uh, being Neptune uh, by a professional American astronomer, Charles Cowell, who'd read, a, read an article in Sky and Telescope magazine of all places, uh, and went back and looked at um, Galileo's notebooks because the article in Sky and Telescope said Neptune passed close by Jupiter on these nights. And they published this in uh, Scientific American Nature, which is how I uh, heard about it. Now, this is uh, what happened on the night. Here's uh, representations of uh, Neptune uh, undergoing a retrograde loop past Jupiter. And actually, Neptune actually passed behind Jupiter. So it was, this maximizes the chance Galileo is going to see it. And then it comes back for a second pass in case he missed it the first time. <laughs> but he didn't. He saw it in both directions. And it was probably lost in the glare of Jupiter uh, when it was in close proximity here and maybe even down here. So we have now a remarkable result that for the first time since deep antiquity, a human being had seen a new planet. Did Galileo know he'd seen a new planet? There's no indication in his notebooks that he speculated that what he'd seen be was a, was a planet. So let me just conclude with some of the physics of what was going on here. The most important physics was the physics that was inconsistent with the received wisdom. In this, Galileo stands at the boundary between the medieval world, where you learn from reading in books, to the modern world, where you learn by seeing for yourself. The natural phenomena are not the, not the possession of any great authority. You should be able to do experiments, set things up, and see for yourself. And of course, this was not popular with the authorities. And Galileo must have been quite hurt because what he was trying to do was find things out to prevent religious dogma from contradicting them. He wanted to predict, pre, uh, protect the majesty of the Catholic Church. He was a devout Catholic. And here he is called upon to account for himself at the Inquisition. It must have hurt him badly. However, I have been uh, practicing that pose. So I'm finding that it's very useful when I'm dealing with difficult stuff. <laughs>